From Bowling Green State University and the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society, this is BG Ideas. I'm going to show you this with a wonderful experiment. Welcome to the BG Ideas podcast, a collaboration between the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society and the School of Media and Communication at Bowling Green State University. I'm Jolie Sheffer, an Associate Professor of English and American Culture Studies and the Director of ICS. This is the first of several episodes featuring the ICS's Spring 2018 Faculty Fellows. ICS is proud to sponsor fellowships to promote the research and creative work of faculty here at BGSU. Those who receive awards are freed from one semester of teaching and service to devote unimpeded time to the projects they have proposed. These projects must be of both intellectual significance and social relevance, and hopes that their work will generate conversations across disciplines and engage both academic and broader community audiences. Today, we are joined by Dr. Sherry Wells Jensen, Associate Professor of English. Dr. Wells Jensen holds a PhD in linguistics from the State University of New York, University of Buffalo, and her academic interests include phonetics, psycholinguistics, speech production, language preservation, Braille, and xenolinguistics. She's also a member of the advisory board of Messaging Extraterrestrial Intelligence International and has given papers on the relationship between intelligence, perception, and language at the SETI Institute and the International Space Development Conference. We intend to focus today on Dr. Wells Jensen's current project entitled Imagining Life on Other Planets, Reimagining Life on Earth. In this research, Dr. Wells Jensen explores how an intelligent, blind alien race would survive and function, as well as the implications of blindness on their civilization and our ability to find and communicate with them. Her work interrogates our socially constructed assumptions about ability and disability and questions the limits we place on one another. I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Sherry Wells Jensen to the program as one of ICS's Spring 2018 Faculty Fellows. Thanks for joining me, Sherry. We're very excited to have you as one of our fellows. Can you start by telling us a bit more about the project you're working on right now? So I came to this project sort of through a weaving path. It wasn't a natural outgrowth of anything, I don't think. I was invited kind of in in a fabulous tribute to my 12-year-old nerdy self, right? It's sort of a fantasy come true. I was invited to give a paper um, about language and thought at the SETI Institute in a desperate attempt to seem like I knew what I was talking about before that talk, I read everything I could get my hands on about SETI and what their research, what, what they what they were doing lately. And one of the assumptions that I came upon in a lot of their work is that any extraterrestrial civilization capable of building a telescope so that we could contact them would necessarily have some analog of human vision. And I thought, wow, really? 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 Is that? It seemed like that was a box that we didn't need to be in. And so I, I put together a paper doing exactly what you might expect. So, so explaining how uh, an alien race with more or less the abilities that we have as humans, except that they can't see, um, would put together a technological civilization. And I gave the paper, and we had a, we had a fun time, and we talked about it, and uh, we debated a few of the points, and we went back and forth. And when I got done, I stepped away from the podium, and it's important to mention here that I'm blind also, along with my aliens. I stepped away from the podium, and some fella rushed up to me to grab my arm to help me down the stairs. And I thought, doggone it! What have we just done here? We spent the last 20 minutes and change talking about how the blind aliens are capable of all these ordinary things and some slightly extraordinary things. And you have not been able to transfer that knowledge to the person standing right in front of you. You still think you're willing to grant that my blind aliens can smelt metals and build a radio telescope, but I cannot walk down the stairs. And I thought, isn't this odd, demoralizing, fascinating, and odd that the person could not make the jump between this sort of intellectual fun time we were having to the person standing right in front of them. So that's kind of how I ended up in this weird little area where disability studies and astrobiology and linguistics sort of all come joyfully together. Well, you raise so many interesting issues. I've got lots of different questions, but maybe immediately to follow up on what you the last thing you said, which is the way you're bringing together these fields that maybe normally don't 
have much to do with each other. Part of what ICS is interested in is fostering collaboration and interdisciplinary conversation. So what's interesting, you're talking directly to scientific audiences with some of these conversations, and you, but your background is linguistics and English education. So, you know, can you talk a bit about the experiences of translating your work or to different audiences? And, you know, what are the ways in which that has expanded your thinking about your home subject areas, as well as maybe challenge those disciplines? Interesting. So I think in the hard sciences, if they talk to disability studies people at all, it's sort of how am I going to make my classroom accessible? Mm -hmm. And that is done on a continuum of joyfully willing to super reluctant to I'm not doing it Mm -hmm. or it's impossible. So I think it's a bit of a startlement to hard sciences to have somebody come in from a linguistics background or from a disability studies background and start asking them basic questions about things that they've assumed for a really long time. And largely they're very willing and we have great conversations. And then from the other end, talking to disability studies people about the hard sciences, again, most of our interface has been oh, well, how do I get into these classes? How do we get more disabled folk into the hard sciences, into the STEM areas? And so talking to them about, well, how would you smelt metal? Wouldn't that be fun? You want to smelt some metal? I think it's kind of a glorious startlement to them too. And my work in disability studies has been now focused on how do we increase people's sense of agency and their willingness and eagerness to do things that maybe they would not ordinarily have assumed that they had the right to do. So sort of affirming people's rights to explore the world around them. And what would that mean? What would it mean if all of a sudden a whole bunch of disabled people came storming into the STEM fields? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that kind of be great? It'd be great. I think it'd be wonderful. And we think of science as a very objective thing, but we also have to realize that the way you do science is a reflection of who you are. And so in the hard sciences still, we tend to find what we're looking for. That's one of the things that Niels Bohr and and Heisenberg talked about a lot, right? So it isn't just a straightforward, we seek knowledge thing. It's about who we are. Science is a lot about who we are and what we decide to look for. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I answered your question at all. No, I think you did. And I think it's so interesting that, you know, what you're doing is really asking us to rethink the categories of ability and disability and how we read them and the ways in which we find it incredibly difficult to get out of those familiar ways of thinking. And it's what's particularly interesting to me is I think we tend to think about disability studies as, oh, like it's the larger social ways that are limiting. But if you get to know someone one-on-one, right, then your mind will be expanded. But the example you gave at the SETI conference is that intellectually and in the abstract everyone was on board right. but then in the in the immediate present they defaulted to feeling like you needed help yeah. as opposed to tr- directly translating so i don't know if you have any thoughts about how do we get from those abstractions to making them more manifest in the material world. You know, if I had the answer to that. (laughs) But I mean, it takes a lot of curiosity and humility and courage to bust down ways that you've always thought about things, especially people. Mm. Because we like people in their little boxes so we can try to understand them so that we feel safe. This isn't just an able person, disabled person thing, right? This goes across race and gender. And certainly it goes... All the disabled people I know grew up in an able culture, right? So we have it in our heads, too, that, oh, well, we can't really do that, or, oh, this is how we have to live, or these are the things that we have agreed to. And so, like, if I wanted to go get something right now, would I get up and go get it, or would I ask someone to help me? Well, I'm perfectly capable of going to get it, but but am I willing to... Am I willing to do that? Both am I willing to expend the energy and am I willing to deal with able-bodied people around me going, oh, wait, no, wait, no. And I think it, it just takes a lot of courage on both sides to bust out of those constraints. And we don't know what the world would look like. Like, what would it look like? I don't think we know that. If all of a sudden everyone was treated with the same, uh, had the same rights and had the same sense of agency. 
I'm wondering if you see analogs with or expressions of this in language, because what you're talking about is the sort of categories we put people in is the human uh, we're built for pattern recognition, right? And so we sort things that we see all the time. Does our language work that way? And like, are there different, in your work and studying so many different languages and kinds of languages, are there different ways of thinking about categories that we might learn from other languages? Ah, that's an interesting question. I think that categorization thing is underneath all of the languages, right? So it's, I mean, it's a survival advantage. You, you need to, you, you recognize a snake and it might bite you. So you need to be able to recognize all the snakes, all the categories of snake. You don't want to like have to, oh, that's a snake too. Oh, doggone it, it bit me. Oh wait, that's a snake too. Oh, rats. You need to be able to form categories and group things together to survive, right? So that's really hardwired in. So those things, I think, are underneath all languages. And although we might, uh, different languages might tinker a little bit with the details of those things, I think that they're all kind of wired in there the same. I think it's decoration. Like the little differences between de- between languages are more are more decoration than strongly prescriptive limits on how we perceive things. I don't know. Um, Thanks. If I knew the answer to that, also, <laughs> again. Your work challenges assumptions about ability and disability, in part by considering what life might look like on other planets. So what are some of these particular assumptions, and how can thinking about aliens help to deconstruct them? Oh, that's an interesting question. So I think we we have rules, we have social rules about who's in charge and who does things and who is not in charge and who has things done for them. And this is a continuum. And again, it's not just about ability and disability. It's about how men and women behave, how people with different gender identities are expected to behave. So this idea of who gets to do stuff and who should wait and have stuff done for them, and what service are you providing to community as as a person that has stuff done for them, right? Am Am I supposed to be people's good deed for the day? What am I supposed to be? Am I supposed to be people's inspiration? All of those roles that people play interact and intersect with one another and fit together in various ways. And if we don't like that, if we want to disrupt that, it's going to, you can't just step quietly out. It's going to be a disruption. It's going to upset people. It's going to make people angry or sad or feel, make them feel afraid. And so if I lay out a world where nobody, where, where sightedness isn't even a thing, then I get to redesign all the roles, right? So there isn't anybody looking and anybody not looking. We're all equal right, in, that, in that respect. And if we can make the jump, if we can make the intellectual jump from that to our context, then I think maybe we've done a thing that would be useful. At least I hope so. That's why I'm doing this. Right? Absolutely. I, I, hope that, I hope that we can use the power of imagination or the power of, I don't call it whatever you want, whatever you need to call it when you construct a whole world. Right? If we could use that, it, the insights from that situation to question what it is we do and why we do it. That would be a start, right? It would be a start to the revolution. If we're going to have a revolution, which we might as well, (laughs) you know, it's a Thursday, we might as well have a revolution. It's all about imagination, and it's about the willingness to risk imagining something audacious Mm. and the willingness to bring that audacious thing home with you and not just treat it like a casual plaything, but have the courage to take this casual plaything and bring it alive in your life and think the audacious thoughts while having supper. Think the audacious thoughts while walking to work, while you know brushing your teeth. Think about how, give yourself permission to think about how things could really be different. It's so interesting to think about you having that conversation at SETI, right, which I think of as being completely audacious and doing things, you know, began as something sort of deemed impossible or ridiculous or, you know, audacious. And yet they can do that in some ways. And yet you confronted them with the ways in which they had such narrow minded thinking about other aspects. You know, and the thing the thing that that I that gets me about, well, there's many things. I was furious. I was, I, I just held leads. It's just the storm of emotions. And here I am 
preaching audaciousness, telling people, step outside, you know, believe, grow, think, play. And you know what I did when he took my arm and helped me down off the stage? I put my head down. I walked with him. I let him find my chair for me. I couldn't do it. I, 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 I don't know what it was. I was afraid that I might burst into tears. I was afraid I might shout at him. I was afraid. I was afraid, right? I was afraid in that moment after being the person who said, let's do this wondrous thing together, shall we? And when they all said no afterward, when they all said, yeah, but you're still the little blind chick and we're going to help you back to your chair, I did not have a throwdown. I said, okay. Yeah. All of this political stuff is also personal. Mm. Like I'm still seeking that way of digging in my heels and saying, no, no, darlings, this is not what we're doing. We're not playing this game anymore. And I think that that's, that's such a, that move, that social move is really personal and it's really scary, not just abstractly, but personally. Yeah. I mean, I think, I imagine you're, if you were to give, if you were brought back to give a talk again in that role as the expert, you feel totally confident. And then you got sort of in that moment, they sort of switched your hats from being the expert to being someone they were responsible for in some way. And yeah, how do you reassert your expertise when you're being treated as someone to be taken care of? That's It's hard to have the presence of mind to figure out how to make that move back. And the willingness to disrupt. Mm. I mean, I think that's a lot of it. So if I, and, th and there's, I think, uh, well, I, and again, I, I talk about this from the viewpoint of disability because that's, that's the hat that I wear, right? But I mean, every day you, you have to make those calls, right? I'm walking down the, I'm walking across campus and someone says something ridiculous to me or grabs my arm when I'm crossing the street and I have the whole set of choices. Mm. Do I go along quietly and everybody has a normal day and I just suck it up? emotionally? Do I stop and force the person to go through a little educational moment with me, which I don't think helps, to be honest? Do I totally disrupt? My fantasy is that when I'm crossing the street and someone grabs my arm that I'll just throw myself on the ground and scream my head off. Because maybe that's the only way. I don't know. You know, because if because uh, if you're walking across the street and somebody grabs you, your first thing, your first thought is, "I'm being assaulted." Right. It's not allowed. You don't touch me. Don't my body. No touching. Don't touch me. But people touch me all the time, constantly. They're always grabbing me when I walk across the street. And my reaction, my the action, the reaction that I deserve to give as an adult woman in this society is to call it an assault, to scream. Don't you touch me. You have no right to touch me. And that reaction from disabled people is really rare because it's so it's such a disruption. And then we become the bitchy disabled people and they walk, but I just tried to help. So that range of responses is always there. And which choice do we make? And which indignity do we call out and confront? And which do we let go? So it's not just about what the world is and what they're imagining. It's what we're imagining, right, as disabled people. What do we imagine that our rights are? And what do we think we're supposed to be allowed to do? And how much energy do we have to make that happen? Hmm. You've, uh, at your talk, imagination was one of the key words. And so and now you're talking about disruption. So I feel like imagination and disruption, we could do a lot worse than urging folks to have more of each of those. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm going to sort of shift gears. Pop culture portrayals of contact with aliens range from ridiculous to sentimental to darkly serious. Recently in the film Arrival, that was addressed xenolinguistics as a field of knowledge. And I know you have talked about that film. So what do you think portrayals such as these get right? And what do you think they're still missing or kind of retreading in older models? Okay, so first off, um, they're probably not coming, right? Because there is this whole speed of light thing. So sorry, but they're probably not coming. Um, they're not going to show up in orbit around Jupiter. And that's what we all want. Well, we say we want that, right? I don't know. If, I don't think we, I'm not sure that we actually do. But so we're probably just going to get a message, which could come, you know, it could be showing up now. I don't really know, right? It could happen any moment. Or it, or maybe it will never happen. I don't know. But if we get, we get a message 
honestly, I think probably if we get a message from ET, we will be transformed for about a week and a half. And then the, you know, somebody in, I don't know, the president of the United States will tweet something and we'll be like, oh, we'll pay attention to that now. I don't, I don't think that the message will transform us as much as we hope slash fear that it will. But you can't make a movie about that, right? <laughs> like we got the message and then we forgot about it and then we went back to eating cheeseburgers and everything was the same. Pretend like the speed of light isn't a thing for a minute. Bracket that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the arrival was actually a really was actually a really good uh, depiction of what that would be like. I think Ted Chang is a, the guy who wrote the story on which the movie was based. Is I think pretty savvy. The thing that arrival got wrong was it. Well, two things. First off, she got successful way faster than you know, you know than she would. Even just among Earth languages, when you try to do that monolingual field methods thing that she was doing, learning a language with no translation, there's a whole heck of a lot more misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. We do this in my interlinguistics class a lot. We bring in a speaker of a language that I don't speak, and we bring in some props, kind of like she did, right? And we point and gesture and carry on, and in about 20 minutes, we get to sentences like, I throw the rock, I drop the rock, I... I throw two rocks. You know, we can get we can get that far, but the reason we can get that far is that we share an awful lot of assumptions about what's going on and what the goal of that is. We share a lot of cultural stuff. Like if I hold up a rock and make a inquiring face at you, <laughs> first off, you know that my inquiring face means inquiring. Second off, you understand that because we are who we are and we're doing what we're doing, this isn't a threat. This isn't. A, a marriage proposal. This isn't a challenge to wrestle. This is me asking you the word, and you assume that there's a word, and I assume that there's a word for rock, and you give it to me. So there's so much, there's so much cultural stuff layered into learning one another's languages and even, even the idea that that's what we're doing. So they got that. I mean, I suppose they just sped that up for effect, yeah. right? I mean, we don't we don't want to watch her be Time all that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If it'd gone on for a year, and yeah, I don't know. And then the idea that a language can t change your perception of time is, as far as I know, um, crazy. <laughs> Give us twenty, thirty years, and we'll know if life exists on other planets in our solar system, and maybe we'll be able to detect oxygen in atmospheres of planets, extrasolar planets, and that might give us some idea if there's life there. So 20, 30 years, we'll know if there's microbes out there, right? I, I feel very confident of that. But whether we'll know that there's intelligent life, I don't know. And what, how that life will have organized itself, or if it has organized itself culturally, socially, between planets, I just don't, I mean, there's so much that we don't have any idea about. And that's kind of the great thing, right? And that's kind of the struggle. For me, that's part of the struggle, is getting people to drop what they think. Stop thinking that you know what life on other planets, culturally, physiologically, is going to be like, because we don't. So simultaneously, to relieve, you know, get rid of some expectations, while also unharnessing the imagination, to imagine beyond the Star Trek versions yes. of alien life yes. that we've seen. Right. So unthink yourself, right? Get out get out of your box. And so I try to do that with the blind aliens. That's one of the ways that I'm trying to systematically step outside of our assumptions while still remaining grounded in physics and chemistry because there still are going to be physics and chemistry in our universe. We're going to all obey the laws of physics. And we're all going to, you know, be made of chemicals. And that's all going to still be happening. So there are limits, but within those limits, all kinds of marvelous things can happen. And we are one way that intelligence has manifested. And so we get to thinking that that's the way it's going to be. But that's just one way. You know, there's all kinds of ways it could happen. So what are you working on next in xenolinguistics? Okay, so... so Taking a step back, we don't really know where language came from on Earth. And it pains me to say it. I mean, you, th you think you'd know that, right? But no, we don't know that. Whether uh, somewhere roughly maybe 50, 
thousand, maybe one hundred fifty thousand years ago, was there some kind of abrupt mutation that made both complex thought and language possible, or just language possible, or is language emergent from culture and the combination of culture and the sort of bodies we have and the sort of needs we have, and so we don't know really where language came from. So given that minor problem <laughs> that we don't know what where our thing even came from. If we, my next sort of playground is xenolinguistics in the area of how would would we be able to learn a language from another planet? So if they are, oh, I don't know, three-headed lizards, just to pick a thing, how would would the fact that they're three-headed lizards make the structure of their language different enough that we really couldn't learn it? So we've got quite a bit of linguistic diversity on Earth, but you can learn any language you want to. I mean, if you want to put in the time, right? And we could learn, the average human brain can learn about eight languages fluently, which makes me think I've been wasting a lot of time because yeah, I don't boy, speak eight me languages. Too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so anyway, and some of them are, are more difficult than others, but that just has to do with your starting place, right? So I could learn Danish faster than I could learn Japanese because I'm an English speaker. But would, there, would the three-headed lizard people, would their language and the way that they constructed their culture and the, the, the exigencies of living on whatever planet they live on, would that make their language so different from ours that we couldn't learn it? Or is there something about hierarchically structured complex thought that would mean that our languages would be similar-ish to each other so we could learn them? I want to write the chapter, and I want to call it something like, could the walrus really talk to the carpenter? Because a walrus and a carpenter have very different body shapes, and theoretically, walrus culture is really different than lang than uh, than carpenter culture, right? So could they talk to one another? Fascinating. So once again, this is a kind of thought experiment, right? And And are you going to try and sort of figure out what those stages of development would be, similar to how you thought through how a blind race would learn to make a radio telescope? I don't know. I'll probably play just, just lay out the possibilities because it's really, I mean, in some ways this is all completely silly, right? Because we don't have any alien languages, so what am I even doing? But on the moment when the radio signal comes, then everything is going to get real really fast. And if we haven't thought about these things, if we haven't tried to think through how languages could be different. And I don't know if I'm, I don't know how capable my brain is of thinking up walrus, <laughs> you know. I mean, I can, make, I, can, I can make up what walrus language would be like, but it would be me starting from my understanding and my intelligence and probably the languages that I speak and, you know, all that. But I think it's really important to kind of spread out some of the possibilities in front of us so that if we ever need them, we've done some of that work already. We're not suddenly trying to invent all these ideas when the message from the stars is in our hands and we're already too excited and maybe a little panicked so that we've got some groundwork laid. You were talking on the way over that you're also doing some work or talking about the history of Braille as a language. And so could you tell us a little bit about some of those other projects you're working on? Yeah, it's nice to have the Thank you, thank you, thank you, ICS. It's nice to have the time to spread out a little bit. So I've always been interested in Braille because, because what? Because I read it. And because the history is so interesting. So any, so Braille is a writing system and any language in the world can be written in Braille. It's not phonetic, it's just a representation of letters. So English Braille is a representation of English, of the Roman alphabet. Japanese Braille is a representation of the Japanese syllabary system. So I've been, I've been lucky to attend an international Braille research symposium put on by some folks at Rice University. They did a marvelous job. We had researchers from all around the world. So there's a, been a lot of work done on print reading and writing, just tons, right? There's, whole, there's journals and journals and books and books. You could read your whole life and never get done with the research on reading and writing print. But Braille was only finalized and adopted in the U.S. in 1932, and it was only invented a century before that. And not much science has gone into 
the process of reading, how people move their two hands. Do they read with when they're when they're moving two hands on the page? What are the patterns that they make? Do they read with one hand than the other? What's the best recommended way of teaching reading? How reading is processed? So there's really interesting research doing brain scans of people while they're reading Braille. So if you are a native reader of Braille, meaning that that was your first orthographic experience, your first writing system, we know that blind people who read Braille use visual cortex because that's not doing anything okay. you know, else. Yeah. So we use visual cortex both to read Braille and to process some aspects of syntax, of complex syntax. When I read this, when I read this research, and I guess it was the late '90s when this stuff came out, a bunch of my friends offered to whack me on the back of the head to see if I felt dots instead of seeing stars. <laughs> I have friends like that; they're lovely. But what does that, you know, what does that mean about how we should teach Braille, and what are the limits of what you can do with Braille if you have actually, and and what does that say about brain plasticity, mm. and what's possible for human beings if this whole chunk of your brain that is normally used for processing vision. What does that mean that now that is used for processing Braille? It's not used for processing other, it's not like it just becomes the tactile center because your tactile stuff is still processed in the ordinary places. It's just reading. Like, why does that, why? Why does that happen? And what does it mean? That's really interesting. I mean, it strikes me in talking to you about this that linguistics as a field is already at the intersection of many different disciplines, because you're talking about neuroscience as well as thinking about language and imagination and expression, right? Sort of the creative expression is con in some ways contingent on what are the language structures in that particular language. So you're sort of really well placed to be thinking interdisciplinarily since your home discipline touches on so many different things. Linguistics is really big. And we always, we always say that whatever you're doing, if there's language in it, it's actually linguistics. Mm -hmm. So, you know, y'all are just sub-disciplines <laughs> of linguistics. Everything is so, astrobiology, sub-discipline of linguistics. Culture, anthropology, sub-discipline of linguistics. Well, and you're also talking about culture, too, because you were saying that part of w one of the things you're going to be talking about on NPR has to do with the history of resistance to Braille. So you've talked about kind of the language and how that is learned in the brain and what that might mean. But what about for how culturally we have understood new languages or new written forms and what that might say about us as a culture or a yeah. society? It's all tied up, right? So, so Blind people didn't generally even go to school until maybe some of us got to go to school in the 19th century, a few, not many. And it was all sort of residential special schools, right? And that's a whole another rabbit hole we could go down, but let's try not to. Um, so, so before there was Braille in these schools, blind people were taught to read by um, feeling raised representations of Roman letters. So, you know, like a nice sign that has stand-up letters or like door numbers sometimes are embossed, right? And you can trace those with your fingers and read them. And you can read that, I can read that, but it's not super fast mm -hmm. and you can't write it. So you saddle, it's, I think it's, it's meaningful in a way that sort of makes my skin crawl and makes me angry. It's meaningful that the primary reading system for blind people was something they could read but had no control over writing. Yeah. Like, who's got the power there? Let's stop and think about that for a second. So a variety of other kinds of writing systems came, sort of arose roughly at the same time, so that a literate blind person who wanted to read everything there was to read at, say, the early part of the 20th century had to know at least three different kinds of raised dot systems which was a pain in the neck, I tell you what, you had to be, it's like, it's like you had to be able to read in the Roman alphabet and the Cyrillic alphabet and, you know, Japanese kana all at once. But when these raised dot systems, in particular Braille, was introduced, the people at the schools didn't like it because the sighted teachers, and they were all sighted teachers, the sighted teachers couldn't read it. And so they didn't like the idea at all of these blind people doing this thing that they couldn't 
read and understand. And they could have learned to read it. Let's just be clear. They just didn't want to. They didn't want to put the energy into it. It was much easier to make the blind people learn this awkward, difficult, raised line script. But with Braille, the blind people could not only read faster, but they could write. Because the, the mechanisms for writing Braille, you just need something to punch holes through paper, right? So there was a great deal of resistance. And one of the, the head of the school, where Louis Braille went to school and where he invented the system, actually at one point had a book burning. They went through the school. They searched the students' rooms. They pulled out anything that the students had written in Braille. Some, they, had, they had actually transliterated books into Braille pulled it out into the courtyard and had a book burning just to show them that we weren't going to have that. And it took, it took, so Braille was, the beginning of the invention of Braille was in the early, early 19th century. And it took 100 years before it began to be widely used. The resistance started melting in the late 1900s, but it took, it took a long time. What you're really talking about, that reaction, is um, how disruptive it is to not just develop new tools, but to develop tools that shift that power balance and shift people out of those roles, right? If all of a sudden the sighted teachers are the ones who have to learn this new thing, and if the students are able to write and read themselves, that disrupts things. So You've got the real power of literacy there. Not only can you read back loyally what a sighted person has written for you, but now you can write your own stuff. You can pass notes. You can make lists. You can write your thoughts down. You get that freedom that comes from literacy, that power that comes from literacy. And do we want, did they want blind people to have that? Nuh uh. No, they sure didn't. I have one last question. For you. As you know, ICS is deeply interested in fostering conversations outside of academia, uh, as well as across departments in BGSU. What are the sort of larger questions you're hoping to raise with your work? And what is the relevance to the broader community? Let me do the broader community one first. Great. You can remind me about the other one okay. in a second. So lots of people are disabled, right? And nobody, nobody signs up for that willingly. Everyone you know, would go to a certain amount of energy to avoid it. And I think that one of the things that I want to say to people is that this can be a way of living that is still joyful and powerful. If you can pause the fear for a moment and think about how you are still you, no matter what your body shape is, that can be very freeing. And as you get older, you know that your body will change. There are accidents that can happen. There's illnesses that can happen. But everyone, as we get older, our bodies change, our abilities change. And sometimes, so unfortunately, tragically, our sense of who we are, we allow to change with that. We allow to begin to think of ourselves as less valuable, less powerful. Our happiness fades, right? It, it can anyway, right? And we, we, we begin to live with a lot of regret because of the change in the way that our bodies are functioning. It doesn't have to be that way. We can continue to live full and joyful and meaningful lives, no matter what our sensory inputs are or what our body is capable of doing. And I think that's one of the things that I wish that I would like to be able to communicate to people. And with that understanding would come all kinds of social change, which would be marvelous. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the outside picture. Let's see, within the disciplines. Oh, yeah, like what are some of the kind of maybe more intellectual questions you'd like your work to help raise? Let's see. So I'm kind of on the path with these, right? So what else can you imagine? How else could a civilization form itself, and how does that inform what we are doing now and what choices would we like to make? What changes would we like to make if we could make some changes? Also, sort of from the accessibility side, if we believe this, and we say we do, we say we believe that everyone is equal, right? Well, if we take that seriously, then how does that inform accessibility for students, for disabled students into all kinds of different classes, right? So we have kind of the advocacy part for students. And I think in general, just questions about what is the relationship between language and thought and culture? How do those things, that's the big question, right? That's always the big question. How does our culture construct and inform language? 
We know that you can say anything you want to say in any of the languages on earth, but what pieces of that are from our culture? Mm -hmm. And if we manipulate, so thinking from the xenolinguistics perspective, right? If we had some other language on some other planet, how would it be different? So those are some of the. Those are some of the. Big, That's big wonderful. Questions. Again, imagination and disruption. Let us yeah. all be more disruptive and more imaginative <laughs> yes. in the ways we go about the world. Yeah. Thank you so much, Thank Sherry. You. This is fun. Great to hear about your work, and I'm Just glad that uh, you could be here with us today to talk a little bit more about it. Question. Our producer today is Chris Cavera. Special and thanks to the College of Arts and Sciences and the BGSU Planetarium, where Sherry was able to give her talk. Thank you very much.